Galatians chapter 2 and verse 14 from the New English Translation. Paul says, But when I saw that they were not behaving consistently with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, or Peter, in front of them all, if you, although you are a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you try to force the Gentiles to live like Jews? The logic is so palpably clear that you wonder how Peter must have felt when Paul asked that question of him. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, who is like unto you? There is no God like you. You are great and greatly to be praised. You are the great sovereign of the universe. You are the one who commanded and it was done. You are the one spoke and it stood fast the strength of the hills is yours the sea is yours and you made it and your hands formed the dry land we worship you Lord and we give you the glory that is due to you help us tonight lord for we surely need your help in more ways than one and we thank you lord for your presence we thank you for your tranquilizing peace we thank you for the understanding that you have given to us through our increasing awareness of the message of the gospel. And so we commit this evening's proceedings into your hands. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Brothers and sisters, those who are here and those who may be viewing us, I want to ask you to try to, to engage your minds. And not just, not just rely on me to engage your mind. Try to, try to think and process. This is a very important lesson. In our previous lesson, we considered verses 11 to 13 of Galatians chapter 2. In these verses, the Apostle Paul outlines for his readers the circumstances which led to the crisis in Antioch. The incident recorded in Galatians chapter 2 2 and verses 11 to 21 involve two apostles, Peter, the apostle to the Jews, and Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. The incident also involved a misrepresentation of the gospel which led to an unnecessary 
and unfortunate separation of Jews from Gentiles, as well as a public rebuke. It is clear that the confrontation that occurred between Peter and Paul dealt with one basic issue. The confrontation between Peter and Paul dealt with one basic issue. Unfortunately, only Paul seemed to realize what the issue was and how serious it was. And I hope that some of us would have already realized from last week what the basic issue was and that if we have not, that we will realize this evening and really appreciate how serious it was. When Peter separated himself from the Gentile believers, he was in effect denying the heart and power of the gospel. By refusing to eat with the Gentile converts, Peter was essentially saying that the justification, the salvation that God had granted to them as a result of their faith in Jesus Christ was of no effect. For Peter's actions conveyed to them that as far as he was concerned, until they had adopted the practices of the Jewish law, they were not fully members of the body of Christ. I want you to think about this. It must have disturbed Paul greatly when he realized that Peter, one of the original apostles, failed to grasp the full significance of the gospel. I wonder if it disturbs the heart of God when we fail to grasp the full significance of the gospel and when we feel that Anything that is preached from a pulpit is the gospel. This wasn't a sidebar issue. And we're going to see how serious it was. One of the things I just want to say quickly up front as a teaser is that Paul himself wrote to Timothy, rebuke not an elder. So how is it that Paul, who wrote that, finds himself in the position of rebuking an apostle? Let's dig into it. Peter had come to visit the church in Antioch. And at first, had gladly engaged with the Gentile believers, participating fully in the life of the body of Christ. That was a blessed time to be in the church at Antioch. That was a time when the implications of the gospel were being fully realized, fully lived out. But when a contingency of Jews arrived from Jerusalem, Peter withdrew from the Gentile believers. 
many of the Jews in the region, including Barnabas, followed Peter's example. This action divided the church into two camps. By their withdrawal from table fellowship with the Gentiles, the Jewish believers were in effect implying that there were two bodies of Christ, one Jewish and one Gentile, and that was heresy. That was heresy. Can I tell us that God never intended for there to be a black church and a white church? Because there is no black gospel and white gospel. There is no doubt that Peter's action and that of the Jewish minority had a serious negative impact on the Gentile believers in Antioch. It implied that Gentile believers were second-class citizens in God's kingdom. But Paul saw more than the momentary hurt. Paul even saw more than the hypocrisy. Paul saw the deadly intrusion of works into the gospel message. Paul understood the hurt that the Gentile believers were feeling. He understood that Peter and Barnabas and the other Jewish brethren were guilty of hypocrisy. But for Paul, Though these matters were serious, they were largely peripheral. The basic issue was the gospel. The gospel. Paul realized that this was no small matter but that the gospel message was in jeopardy. And so he reacted. He confronted Peter publicly and charged him with hypocrisy. In verses 14 to 21, Paul explains the justification for his rebuke of Peter and as I said at the start, we are only going to be able to look at one verse this evening. In verse 14, he writes, But when I saw that they were not behaving consistently with the truth of the gospel... I said to Cephas, to Peter, in front of them all, if you, although you are a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you try to force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Paul understood clearly that Peter, by his withdrawal from the Gentile believers in Antioch, had contradicted and thus compromised the truth of the gospel 
That was the basic issue. And like I said, unfortunately, Paul seemed to be the only person who realized that. Even the apostle who received the keys of the kingdom didn't understand it. That is serious. Or if he understood it, he allowed himself to be compromised. Which is again a reason why I have said to us repeatedly, do not repose your faith in any man. Hear me now, brothers and sisters. There's no way that I can sidestep the issue. If we are going to look at this thing critically, we have to look at where we are coming from. So, we formally believed that the gospel was contained in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. We were told that. What does it say? Let me read it to you from the New English translation. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, let us, for argument's sake, say that that is the gospel. Well, wouldn't Peter have satisfied those requirements? Wouldn't Peter have been baptized? And wouldn't he have received the Holy Spirit? Yes or no, brothers and sisters? Yes. So how then could Paul say you are not walking according to the truth of the gospel? If Acts 2.38 is the gospel and Peter had satisfied these requirements, how could Paul charge him with hypocrisy as it relates to the gospel? Peter would have said, but I have satisfied Acts 2.38. This lesson is important partly because it clearly demonstrates that Acts 2.38 is not the gospel. Because if it was the gospel, Paul could not have charged Peter with hypocrisy as it relates to the gospel. And just as it Paul's heart that Peter didn't understand the basic issue. If at the end of this lesson we didn't understand the basic issue, it would pain my heart. And certainly it would pain God's heart, which is far more important. And when we that it is important for us to get the gospel right. It is because if we don't get it right, the way we conduct ourselves will reveal that we don't understand the message of the gospel, which is what is happening here.
Paul understood clearly that Peter, by his withdrawal from the Gentile believers in Antioch, had contradicted and thus compromised the truth of the gospel. That was the basic issue. The gospel proclaimed that salvation for both Jews and Gentiles was by the way of the cross of Christ and union with him. But Peter's separation from fellowship with the Gentile believers implied that salvation for Gentiles required strict adherence to the law and incorporation into the Jewish nation. Now it is likely that Peter would have denied that he meant to communicate this requirement to the Gentile believers. But how else could his action be interpreted? If I, on a fellowship Sunday, cannot sit down beside you and eat a meal with you, what is that saying about the way I interpret the gospel? This is not just a Peter and Paul issue. This is a Grace Workshop Ministries issue. I hope we realize that. The Gentile believers could not help but conclude from Peter's withdrawal that he, the one regarded as the preeminent apostle, was of the opinion that their standing before God was not as secure as his own, and that if they wanted to enjoy fellowship with himself and other Jewish believers, they would have to become Jews. Their experience of salvation would be incomplete until they became Jews and observed the Jewish law. That is what the Gentiles would have picked up from Peter's behavior and from Barnabas's behavior and from the behavior of the other Jews. That is what the action would have said to them. The Gentile believers would have seen these implications of Peter's action even if he himself did not. Although Peter did not say so specifically, his behavior, his behavior said quite plainly that the observance of the law must be added to faith in Christ if sinners are to be saved. Do we believe that something must be added to faith in Christ in order for sinners to be saved. Do you believe that? Do I believe that? From Peter's example, the Gentiles could not help but draw the conclusion that the law was necessary for salvation. I hope you realize that I am saying the same thing over and over again to help us to 
understand how serious this situation was. Peter, Barnabas, and the other Jewish defectors were by their actions denying the truth that on the basis of Jesus Christ's death and resurrection and that only both Jews and Gentiles who believe are accepted equally and fully by God. What are we adding to the gospel, brothers and sisters? Faith in Jesus Christ or believing or putting our trust in Jesus Christ plus what? Plus baptism? Plus speaking in tongues? Plus not processing the hair, plus not wearing jewelry, plus not wearing pants for women. Don't look at me like Alice in Wonderland. We have to straighten it out, and we are going to. If you don't like to hear it raw, you're in the wrong place. In fact, you're in the wrong church. We are going to deal with the issues because Paul certainly did. What are we adding to the gospel message? Because Paul had a very clear sense of what the gospel meant, and thank God he did. He confronted Peter, not about mere technical points of doctrine, but about something Peter, sorry, Paul saw as fundamental for the gospel. Paul feared. Peter's decision not to eat with the Gentiles threatened the truth of the gospel and would fracture the church. Hear me this evening, brothers and sisters. While the gospel message is a message about the salvation of individuals, it is also a message of unity. It is a message of bringing together in one all people who call on the name of Jesus. I remember years ago, Michigan and Smiley put out a recording. The social barriers broke down. In one love jam down. The wrist and the dreadlocks come together in an idle wedlock. It would be a tragedy if in Jamaica the social barriers could be broken down, but they can't be broken down in the church. It would be sad if there is a standard that a black man can't marry a white woman. It would be sad if there is a standard that you, lady, 
your social standing is too low for you to get married to this man. It would be a tragedy if I look at you and because your hair is processed, I believe that you are not as spiritual as I am. See, brothers and sisters, I am determined to try my best to pursue a biblical mandate for the Grace Workshop Ministries. And I'm going to pursue it with everything that is in me. And it doesn't matter what is happening around me. My wife mentioned to somebody just a few minutes ago that Daniel was safe in the lion's den. Brothers and sisters, I just have to be plain. If you are not serious about pursuing a biblical mandate for our church. You need to unloose your seatbelts. We're very, very serious. There's no way I am going to be here and we are just doing church. There is no way I'm going to be here and we pursue being a brand name church. I have no interest in that whatsoever. I have no interest in pastoring a mega church. None. We need to be a God-honoring, Christ-exalting, biblically-driven church. And we, by the grace of God, are not going to compromise on the gospel. Paul says that Peter, Barnabas, and the other Jewish believers were not behaving consistently with the truth of the gospel. The Greek word translated consistently is orthopodeo. You know which English word we get from that. Can you tell me? Orthopedic. The word literally means to walk with straight feet. Thus, to walk a straight course. It speaks of straightforward, unwavering, sincere conduct in contrast to a crooked, wavering, and more or less insincere course, such as Peter and the other Jews 
were guilty of. We could say that they were not walking, walking orthopedically, that is, in a straight path. The idea is that Peter did not pursue a straight course in relation to the truth of the gospel. He did not deal honestly and consistently with it. His was an attitude that led him to compromise its sacred truth, to twist it, to misrepresent it, to deal crookedly with it. What an indictment of Peter, who had three times on the house of Simon the Tanner, received a vision from God, telling him that what God had cleansed, he was not to regard as common or unclean. Like I said last week, I hope that this incident in Antioch happened before the Jerusalem Council. But I don't think it did. Now there would be several persons who would disagree with me. But I don't think it did. And it really doesn't matter. Hear me, brothers and sisters. While compromise is an important element in getting along with others. We should never, we should never, we should never compromise the truth of God's word. If we feel we have to compromise our doctrinal beliefs to match those of influential persons in our life, we are on shaky ground. In fact, we are hypocrites. Some of us may have been guilty of this in the past. Maybe even now. So you will wear jewelry and pants to certain events. But if you know that you will see certain people, you won't do it. That's hypocrisy. If you have a conviction, don't do it at all. If I acted in that way, what my actions would be saying is that I fear people more than I fear God. I regard human beings more than I regard God who is seeing me at all times. And some of the people who are highly critical of us are guilty of that. In some of their gatherings, they let it all hang out, but never on Sunday. That's not really my concern. My concern is with the members of the Grace Workshop Ministries. We can't operate like that. The judge in the parable in Luke 18 would be more righteous than us because at least he was consistent. 
He did not fear God and he did not regard man. But we are very inconsistent sometimes. We don't fear God. We regard man. That's hypocrisy. And that's a compromise of the truth of the gospel. If I care what my parents think more than I regard what the word of God supports, I am on shaky ground. If I regard what my wife thinks more than I regard what the word of God says, I am on very shaky ground. I told you that this is one of the most significant lessons that I have ever taught or will ever teach. Because we think that Paul just had a little mishap. He made a little mistake. It's not such a big deal afterwards. He withdrew from eating with the Gentiles. So what? It wasn't so what for Paul. And we haven't even seen how serious it was yet. Because of the gravity of the situation, Paul had to confront Peter publicly. He spoke to him, the Bible says, in front of them all. It is apparent that Paul's rebuke of Peter was not given before the officers of the church only or before a specially convened and restricted number of people, but before all the members of the Antioch church, both Jew and Gentile, who were present. We're talking about what we would call a saint's meeting. Paul called a saint's meeting on Peter. That's how seriously we call saints meeting to read out people about fornication. But Paul called the saints meeting to deal with a compromise of the truth of the gospel. That's how seriously he felt it was. And we are here playing with the gospel, believing that every preaching is the gospel. Paul made no attempt to arrange for a private discussion from which the public was excluded. According to Galatians 2.2, which we have dealt with already, the consultation in Jerusalem had been private, but the confrontation in Antioch had to be public. Paul was finished with consultation. This is your call for confrontation. Peter's withdrawal from the Gentile believers had caused a public scandal, and so he had to be opposed in public too. In commenting on the situation, Spurgeon wrote the following. It must have been very painful to Paul's feelings to come into conflict with Peter, whom he greatly esteemed. But yet, for the truth's sake, he knew no persons. And he had to withstand even a beloved brother when he saw that he was likely to pervert the simplicity of the gospel and rob the Gentiles of their Christian liberty. For this, Spurgeon says, we ought to be very grateful to our gracious God who raised up this brave champion 
this beloved apostle of the Gentiles. John MacArthur has an interesting comment regarding Paul's public rebuke of Peter. And before we read John MacArthur's quote, I want to read 1 Timothy chapter 5 for us, some of the verses. It's going to be mentioned in John MacArthur's quote, but I want to read it for us. First Timothy chapter 5 and verse 1. Do not address an older man harshly, but appeal to him as a father. That older man there really is a reference to elders because this whole section is dealing with elders, at least largely. Listen to what he says in verse 17. Elders who provide effective leadership must be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard in speaking and teaching. For the scripture says, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain, and the worker deserves his pay. So the truth is that double honor there doesn't mean praise. The Greek literally means double salaried. It's true. I'm not complaining about my remunerations, you know. I just want you to know what the scripture says. You need to know it's not about praise. Oh, thank you for doing such a good job with the message. That's why Paul says, do not muzzle an ox. And the worker deserves his pay. Verse 19, do not accept an accusation against an elder unless it can be confirmed by two or three witnesses. Those guilty of sin must be rebuked before all as a warning to the rest. Paul is talking about Elders, he's not talking about the ordinary member of the church. And in some of the churches that we are coming from, we have actually never seen this happen to an elder, but we have seen it happen many times to ordinary members of the church. That is hypocrisy. Lord Jesus, help me. Help me. Help me to do this. John MacArthur says, and I quote, 1 Timothy 5.1 says, Rebuke not an elder, but rather appeal to him as a father, to the younger men as brothers. In other words, be careful how you talk about elders. You say, what if they deserve it? Okay. Go to 1 Timothy 5.19. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except on the basis of two or three witnesses. In other words, be sure that it's confirmed. Why? Because men who are in positions of spiritual leadership are targets for criticism, and much of it unfounded. And it should be substantiated before it's made an issue. But notice the next verse, 1 Timothy 5.20. When you do find out that it is true what that elder is accused of, them that sin rebuke before all that others also may fear. In other words, you don't try to hide the rebuke of a person in a position of leadership, you make it just as public as was the display of his sin. In order that 
people might know that you truly believe what you say you believe. Don't miss this. You make it just as public as was the display of his sin. Peter got up in public from table fellowship with the Gentiles. So Paul had to rebuke him in public. Paul set down a tremendous pattern in the church, and that is, I don't care who you are when you're out of line and your out-of-line activity is public, it's going to get rebuked publicly that others may know the church doesn't tolerate that. I should really ask us to stand and worship the Lord, but I won't. Brethren, let me ask us this question. Are we prepared to deal with gospel truth? Are we prepared to deal with the truth of the gospel? Or do we just want to play with plaster seed? Do we want to just continue to remain in the sandbox and climb on jungle gyms? Am I prepared to deal with the truth of the gospel? Am I prepared to suffer for the gospel? Once we suffered for things that had nothing to do with the gospel. We couldn't wear this. We couldn't go there. We couldn't do this. That had nothing to do with the gospel. Now that we are being called upon to take a stand for the gospel, we are afraid. And we say, I don't want Bishop so-and-so to see me doing this or see me going there. This has to do with the gospel, folks. Something else that we need to say. And I'm not being overly critical of Peter because I am full of flaws myself. And you know it. But though Peter had been saved... He had received New Testament salvation. Even though the Holy Spirit indwelt Peter, Peter was still capable of yielding to the Adamic nature, the flesh. He was an apostle but he was still capable of hypocrisy. And if a man like Peter is capable of it, let us never think that we are any better. So before we are critical of Peter, before I am critical of Peter, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed. I certainly do not believe that it would have been easy for Paul to confront Peter publicly. He may have been tempted to call Peter to a corner for some private correction. I would have been tempted to do that. My personality is like that. My personality is like that. But Paul knew the cost of avoiding public confrontation was potential compromise of the integrity of the gospel. A church that does not discipline sinning leaders publicly will eventually lose its credibility because it does not take its own doctrine seriously. So you understand that, brethren, I'm preaching to myself right here. There is no question whatsoever of the preciousness of Peter 
and his ministry. But the truth is more precious than any leader of the church, including Peter. I don't care who it is. It may have been your spiritual father or mother. If they are not walking according to the truth of the gospel, they must be called out. If I am not doing it, I must be called out. Somebody looking on might have said, Paul, you got upset with Barnabas for this. Look how good Barnabas has been to you over the years. Barnabas was the one who spoke up for you when nobody wanted to accept you. Barnabas is the one who went for you and brought you to Antioch and exposed you to ministry. Paul! Paul! So because Barnabas has done all of that for me, if he is compromising the truth of the gospel. What am I to do? The Barney, I saw it go. If Paul had done that, he would have regarded Barnabas more than he regarded Jesus Christ. What am I saying, brethren? I am saying that if one of you were to come to me and say, Pastor, you know I'm supposed to do this course of study, but I don't have sufficient funds. Can the church help me? And then... I organize for the church to help you. And then some years from now, after I help you, I behave hypocritically. What am I expecting from you? Do you understand, brethren, that I have to now be carefully examining my motives? When I help you, why am I helping you? So that you can be bonded to the Grace Workshop Ministries. The church has done this for me, so no care what arms house them keep up. I can't speak a word against it. Pastor has been so kind to me. When I couldn't pay my rent, it was pastor who helped me. So now that pastor is found guilty of stealing, how much it is? $51 million from the church. What I must do now, defend him and say, make him thief it. Him did help me with my rent. No, brethren, no. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. Paul was never ungrateful for what Barnabas had done for him. But Paul had to fear God rather than men. That's how it is, you know, brethren. 
Wow. Wow. Paul's rebuke must have stung Peter. We're going to do a little overtime today. If you, although you are a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you try to force the Gentiles to live like Jews? The word if at the beginning of Paul's statement is a fulfilled condition and could be translated since you are a Jew, Paul says to Peter, since you are a born, since you, a born and bred Jew, have discarded Jewish customs and are living like a Gentile, how unreasonable is it of you to impose Jewish customs on the Gentiles and force them to live like Jews? So how could we make this applicable to us? You eating pork now. And you are asking the Gentiles to eat only vegetables. It is important for us to understand that in this verse, the, wo the word live. If you being a Jew, live like a Gentile. That word live does not refer to inward morality. It refers to the shaping of one's life with reference to external social observances of Christian fellowship such as Levitical restrictions on eating. It describes a mental attitude, a habit, which had in times past demonstrated itself in outward actions and which was still in force, but which was being hypocritically covered up by Peter's action of withdrawing from fellowship with the Gentiles. Tragically, brothers and sisters, what this shows is that Peter had not abandoned it in principle, but had changed his customary external behavior because he was afraid of those Jews who had recently come from Jerusalem. What Paul was saying, what this is saying to us is that Peter knew that nothing no go so. He very well knew that the Gentiles should not be forced to live like Jews. He knew he was persuaded that Gentiles should not have to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. And even when he withdrew from table fellowship with the Gentiles, he didn't do so because he had changed his position. He did so because he feared those who had come from Jerusalem. So that makes it worse. Brethren, are you guilty of that? Am I, the past of the Grace Workshop ministry, is guilty of it? Compromising the truth of the gospel because we fear people is a serious thing. You regard your husband more than you regard Jesus. You regard your wife more than you regard Jesus. You regard your co-workers more than you regard Jesus. You regard the members of the church that you're coming from more than you regard Jesus. Paul, in confronting Peter, directly addresses his inconsistency in withdrawing from the Gentiles 
For by so doing, Peter was saying indirectly that they, the Gentiles, had to obey the Levitical legislation regarding foods in order to be considered acceptable to the Jews and more importantly to God. We're saying the same thing yet another time. Peter, by his action, left the Gentile believers with only one of two choices in the situation. Either to refuse to obey the law in this respect and thus cause a fit in the Christian church or to preserve harmony by coming under the law, which would be to give credence to another gospel, which Paul says is not another. They would now feel like they must live like Jews in order to be sure of both their justification and their sanctification. Such a works-based, performance-driven, legalistic mindset was and still is the absolute antithesis or the exact opposite of the truth of the gospel. Peter did all this with a full understanding of the vision that God had given him, which clearly taught him that the Levitical legislation for the Jew was now a thing of the past, Acts 10, 28, and that the line of separation had been broken down between Jew and Gentile at the cross. It feels serious this is, this is not a man acting in ignorance, you know. This is a man acting against his conscience, violating his conscience to please people. Kenneth Weiss explains that, and I quote, Peter's action of refusing to eat with the Gentiles did not merely have the effect of maintaining the validity of the law for Jewish Christians, but it involved the forcing of that law upon the Gentile Christians. That or creating a wide open division in the church. This latter was what concerned the Apostle Paul. He deemed it of utmost importance to maintain the unity of the Christian church as against any division into Jewish and Gentile groups. At the Jerusalem Council, he had agreed to a territorial division of the missionary field into Gentile and Jewish divisions, but to create a division between Jew and Gentile in a Gentile community and church was out of the question and was something not to be permitted. Brothers and sisters, if we feel that Paul was unnecessarily harsh for rebuking Peter in public, we need to recall that the freedom of all Gentile Christians and the whole future of the Gentile mission was at stake. In fact, it was the gospel itself that was on trial. For if the separation of Peter, Barnabas, and the other Jews had gone unchallenged, then the gospel truth that sinners are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, would have been seriously compromised from a human perspective. And I say again, from a human perspective, from a human perspective, such a precedent would have spelled the end of the Gentile church. Furthermore, if the division along racial lines had been allowed, the church would never have been able to exhibit 
a new humanity unified by faith in Christ. That's what I was talking about earlier, which transcends the racial and social divisions in the world. The truth of the gospel would be negated by such division. Spurgeon said this, and he spoke truly. The idea of salvation by the merit of our own works is exceedingly insinuating. Paul means by that word insinuating, very tempting, very suggestive, very assertive, very difficult to resist. That's what he's saying. The idea of salvation by the merit of our own works is very difficult to resist. He says, it does not matter how often it is refuted, it asserts itself again and again. So after I am finished teaching this lesson, people are still going to go away and say, I have to do something to earn my salvation. And when it gains the least foothold, it soon makes great advances. And that is why some of you here tonight and some of you listening to me still have a problem with this. Hence, when Peter sided with the Judaizing party and seemed to favor those who demanded that the Gentiles should be circumcised. Our brave apostle withstood him to his face. He fought always for salvation by grace through faith and contended strenuously against all thought of righteousness by obedience to the precepts of the ceremonial or the moral law. No one could be more explicit than he, than he was upon the doctrine that we are not justified or saved by works in any degree, but solely by the grace of God. Brothers and sisters, the situation that occasion, Paul's rebuke of Peter in Antioch was not a matter of personality or party. It was a question of the truth of the gospel. Thank God Paul was prepared to fight for it. Thank God Paul was prepared to stand up in the face even of Peter and said, not so, not so. Uh, next week, Lord willing, if we get an opportunity to come back and look at this, one of the things we will observe, well, I'm not sure next week, I probably mention it, is that if you notice, if you read Chapter 2, you'll see that Peter offers no response. He could not say anything to Paul. He had no defense. And thank God, Peter never tried to justify himself. Thank God. So he's better than many of us. He never said, but Peter, this is why I know. No word except, except years later, what did he write? Some of the things that are taught by our beloved brother Paul are hard to understand. And many people trying to twist it get themselves into a lot of trouble. 
our beloved brother Paul. I hope to God, Lord Jesus, please save me enough. Please save me enough. Please let your Holy Spirit transform me enough that if I am wrong and I am rebuked, I will be able to say like David, I have sinned. Let's stand. Our God and our Father, Perhaps only you know only you know the extent of the bravery of Paul. Perhaps only you know how his courage was used by you to preserve the purity of the gospel. When even the one regarded as the preeminent apostle sought to compromise it. Have mercy upon us, Lord, because 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 we are so tempted to compromise the truth of the gospel. We are so tempted to preach a gospel of faith plus. Faith in addition to. We are so susceptible to finding ways to ensure that we make a vital contribution so that somewhere in God receiving glory, we can get even 10% of it. And when we give our testimony, it is chock full of I, I did, and my. But when we understand the gospel right, our testimony is chock full of he, he did this, he foreknew me, he predestinated me, he called me, he justified me, he glorified me. He didn't let me be plucked out of his hand. She kept me even when 
I wanted him to let me go. It was him all the way. That's the testimony of a person who understands the gospel. Such a person will never say, I'm so glad I chose the Lord. Such a person's testimony will always say, there were millions in the world who were so much better than I, but he chose me. Why he chose me, I'll never know. And any message that would seek to rob you of even an iota of your glory is not the gospel and must be condemned. And any message that seeks to give you all the glory and to rob man of every iota of glory must be celebrated and believed. Lord, visit us with your salvation. Really save us, Lord. Really save us. Really save us. Really save us. Really save us and change us from within. Help us never to be ashamed of you and your word. Help us never to add to your word or to subtract from your word. Help us never to regard human beings more than we regard you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.